You know, it's been said, you can't send a six to negotiate with the ten. <laughs> Think about that. That's important to understand. Too many people show up, wing it. What are they going to say? What are they going to do? There's actually formulas that you could follow to negotiate better. Because we negotiate every day. We persuade every day. Even if it's what restaurant you go to or all the way to getting a raise, it's all negotiation. So today we're getting into the lens model of negotiation. This is what law enforcement uses, so stay tuned. Maximize your influence. Kurt Mortensen is the author of Persuasion IQ, Laws of Charisma, and the best-selling book, Maximum Influence. All right, good to have you here. Kurt Mortensen, Podcast 520. As we get into negotiation, persuasion, motivation, influence, mindset, all the things we should have learned in school, especially negotiation. I remember negotiation starts real early in elementary school, negotiating someone else's sandwich for your sandwich, for a piece of cake, for some milk, for a soda. There's negotiating going on. So tell your family and friends and enemies about the podcast. We're on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, iHeartRadio. You can find us at MaximizeYourInfluence.com for everything you need and all the links from this podcast, all the freebies, and all the specials. That's also the place to take your free Persuasion IQ assessment. So let's kick it off with the geeky Scarly article. We're going to talk about odor, scent, the body. You know your olfactory system is deeply rooted in the center of your brain. You smell something, it transforms you. You feel something. Perfume and cologne, are you more persuasive? Well, your rate is more attractive in a nightclub, but in the workplace, most people are wearing way too much and it repels people. What about when you smell the perfume or cologne of an old boyfriend, girlfriend? Hmm, is that good or bad? And the answer is... It depends on the breakup, doesn't it? It could be, oh, good memories versus, oh, that. It triggers all those feelings you had when the breakup occurred. Body odor contribute to social bonding. This is from the Wiseman Institute of Science, Science Daily, and the Journal of Science Advances. Basically, when we smell the same, similarity theory, right? We bond more. So researchers have found that people have a tendency to form relationships or friendships with individuals who have a similar body odor. I guess if you stink, you're attracting stinky people. But it's bigger than this. Even when you're near the smell of Cinnabon, the cinnamon rolls, you're more likely to donate to a charity. So we have this thing called the E-nose. So it's a device, a basically electronic nose that smells people. I'm not sure how it works, but it exists. So the researchers were able to predict the quality of social interactions between complete strangers by first smelling them with this E-nose, this device, and seeing how similar they were. And that's something interesting. You go to other countries, other cultures. Now, there's no right or wrong here. I need to be careful. But they stink to you and you stink to them. Because we all eat different foods. And based on the foods we eat, we have a different smell. That's why when you go to other cultures, other countries, it smells different. You're not used to these smells. I remember in Taiwan, stinky tofu. They actually called it stinky tofu. That takes a while to get used to along with some other smells. And they talk about anyone who's ever walked a dog knows that dogs can usually tell from a distance whether an approaching dog is friend or foe. And that's why they tend to sniff each other. Now, I'm not recommending that next time you go on a sales call or try to persuade somebody. But understand, humans often subconsciously sniff other people. Now, we've talked about it. It's in the law of connectivity and maximum influence with similarity theory that we tend to become friends with people that are similar to our appearance, our background, our morals, our beliefs. That's just how our brain works. Now we're adding smell to this. So we gravitate towards those who smell similar to us. So they use this enos, they assess the chemical signatures of the odors that people have, and they found that friends were found to smell significantly more like each other than did the individuals in random pairs. Then they dug a little deeper and found those who had positive interactions with other people smelled more like each other. Determined again by this e-nose. So they were able to predict with 71% accuracy when two individuals would have positive social interactions just based on smell. And that just reminded me of another study. It's from the Journal of Psychological Science that humans can smell fear and disgust. And these emotions are contagious. 
So it's a reality. If someone's stressed, they're full of fear and anxiety, that could transfer to you or vice versa. So I'm not sure how they did this, but they collected sweat from people watching frightening scenes or repulsive clips. And when they sniffed the fear sweat, their eyes widened in a scared expression. Then the ones watching repulsive clips who were disgusted, and when they smelled that, they scrunched their faces in a repulsive way. Interesting, just by smell. Smell matters. It's no secret that supermarkets that pump that bakery fresh bread smell inside, 300% increase in sales. It's no secret real estate agents were going to cook cookies or bread or potpourri, and it feels like home, it smells like home, it matters. So there you go, that's our geeky Scarly article. Which brings us to the Ninja of the Week. So I was on a family vacation this last week in the Oregon coast, one of my all-time favorite places. And one of the traditions is to go to the Tillabook Milk Factory. Well, they make cheeses and ice cream. It's right on the main road, right on the one-on-one. Signage, billboards to get you there. Free tour, free samples. You're like, yeah. Man, this place was packed. And these were long lines. And so they have a great reputation for quality. And I love what they do with the law of involvement. Free tour, free samples, free cheese, free clean restrooms. And the free tour is self-guided, but you can see how they make cheese. And then you get to sample the cheese. I was just amazed how many people were there willing to wait in the ice cream lines. So not only was it a lot of involvement, it was a lot of social validation. If other people are willing to wait, it must be good. And it is good. I'm not a waiter, but this is good quality ice cream. And they have flavors that you can only get there. And they're not available in the stores. That's why free is the new normal. To prove your worth. Free samples, free estimates, free trials, free coaching session. Whatever it is, prove your worth. And people know, hey, you've got it. You're good. That's what they did with the law of involvement, engagement, free, and social validation. It just wasn't that day it was packed. It's packed every day. So Tillabook Factory, you get the ninja. So what can you do to get people involved and engaged? What can you provide to prove your worth? Not something they don't need, something that doesn't have value to them, but what has value to them that you can provide at a low cost that you can prove your worth, get them into your marketing funnel, and work with them. So what is it for you and your business that you can give away free to prove your worth? Obviously, giving away free cheese, free tours, that's easy for them. Get people in the door, get them engaged, get them involved. What can you do to increase your involvement, that engagement, and prove your worth? All right, which brings us to listener email. Oh, boy! This is from Paula. She's in Salvador. That's in Brazil. Uh, Welcome. She says, Kurt, I'm the product of the perfect persuasive presentation. Thank you for that. I've increased my close rate by 50%. Congratulations. Glad you are seeing increased income and increased success. She says, last week you talked about interrogators. I was fascinating, but I also have heard about this lens model of negotiation. Can you talk about that and compare the two? You bet. So last week, we talked about interrogation, what they use, and some of the techniques we could use in everyday persuasion. The lens model negotiation is also called the law enforcement negotiation stairway lens. So a lot of law enforcement uses this just to follow a structure, a pattern. So let's talk about it. If you're looking for that structure, this is very simplified. I would add some sub-steps to this, but let's go over the big picture here. And this is often used by crisis negotiators, and especially in high-pressure situations. Hey, when your job's in the line, when the deal's on the line, it's all high-pressure situation. Let's talk about it. So some people say the LEN stands for Law Enforcement Negotiation Stairway, but it also stands for the steps. So LENS, listening, empathy, negotiate, solve. So let's spend some time with each one of those and go through those and start with the listening actively listening. And this is true. And we roll our eyes like, oh yeah, we got to listen. But we all stink at it. We can get better. 
So active listening is when you truly understand their needs, their expectations or concerns or objectives. So you're paying attention. It takes a lot of cognitive or mental energy to truly listen, to show interest and not interrupt. We want to interrupt. That's how our brain's programmed. We want to break in. We want to give them our two cents, our ideas, our thoughts, but that's not truly listening. As you listen attentively, that you're gaining a deeper understanding of their perspective that allows you to find potential opportunities, potential roadblocks, and get you to the point where you can get to a collaboration or a compromise. We all know you should listen more than you talk. You're understanding their pain points. You're finding out their objections. Hey, what I'd recommend, if this is a challenge for you, go with a pad of paper. Just draw a line down the middle. On the left side, just write your questions, what you need to find out. And on the right, just leave it blank. And we have a thought, an idea you want to interrupt, just write it down. You feel your brain go, ah. You probably won't even get to it. It'll come up later. You can bring it up later. But it just makes your brain kind of relax and helps you listen. Then you get into empathy. We've talked about EQ. Huge. They got to know that you care. And empathy is acknowledging the other party's feelings, their viewpoints. You're putting yourself in their shoes. You're understanding what motivates them. And when you could truly have this EQ, this empathy, it creates an environment for a productive negotiation. It was interesting, Harvard did a study actually, when you start with empathy, when you start out being kind, there's actually a bump in success rates when you can truly do this. Now, it's probably not when you're dealing with a hardcore negotiator, a purchaser, a buyer. They're past that. They're just going to get it done. They might not care about the empathy. You got to read the situation. I was looking up where the word empathy came from. There's Greek roots, which combines M and pathos. So basically, M means in, and patho means feeling or suffering. So you're in their feeling. You're with them with their suffering. Because you have to understand, a lot of negotiations, the emotions kick in. And that's a challenge. When the emotions are there, it's hard to solve things logically. I mean, divorce is very easy to solve. In fact, working with a real estate negotiator, home going into foreclosure, so the couple just walked away. They both just left it, give it to the bank. We don't care. But there was like $75,000 equity in this thing. So this guy says, hey, look, let me do all the paperwork. I'll take care of everything. Each one of us will take $25,000. One spouse said, sure, okay, whatever. And the other one said, no. If I'm getting 25, that means they're getting 25. I'd rather have the bank have it. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's not a logical thing. That's an emotional thing. Even conflicts around the world that have been going on for thousands of years, are pretty easy to solve logically, but after all those years of emotion and hatred, anger, those emotions make it more difficult to solve. That's one of the keys to understanding negotiation and human nature. So we talked about listening. Remember, this is lens. Empathy in the third is now it's time to negotiate, where we start the discussions to find common ground. Is there anywhere that overlaps that we can come to an agreement on? We're proposing solutions. Maybe we're making concessions. We're talking about beneficial outcomes, that win-win, as they say. Now, careful with the win-win. Win-win does not mean equal splits. It doesn't mean we're dividing it down the middle. A win-win could be 80-20. You could only get 20%. It still could be a win-win for you. Part of that, too, is your BATNA. That's your best alternative to negotiated agreement. Basically, you have alternatives, you have options. You didn't come and say, this is my way or the highway, this is the only thing I'm taking. Hey, maybe they have a better idea than you. Maybe we need to talk about some different options. This is the open, constructive discussions. We're finding those mutually beneficial agreements. And understand, I know you wanna be one and done, but this is not always done in one setting. So with this negotiation step, you're looking at various options, finding common ground, you're addressing the interests of both parties. This is the place where you don't want to dictate what you want. You're collaborating. You're working together, creating solutions, seeking input, and solving the challenges. So true negotiation, everything's on the table that needs to be. Now we go to the S, which is solve, where you work together to develop a solution that satisfies both parties, their interests, their needs. You're defining clear terms. This is where you're getting that compliance or agreement. It means you're closing the deal. You've addressed the objections, and everyone feels it's a win-win. So it's a pretty simplified model. I mean, you need to understand that they can't feel that you're in there one size fits all. You've got to add a few other pieces. You've got to build rapport. You know, you're showing genuine concern. You're building a strong relationship. 
you're being a relatively nice person. I mean, there's times you can go back to the archives and we talked about controlled anger negotiation, how sometimes it can actually help in the outcome, especially if you're at a standstill. Trust that you understand the situation, that you're predictable, you're transparent, you're reliable, you're consistent, you're delivering on your promises, what you say you do. Big part of trust too, are you coming across as competent? And in negotiation, it's interesting that slow is fast. I know you want to be one and done. We talked about this, but going through the steps, showing your empathy, you're doing your listening and competence. You need to let them know, you know, your stuff, teach them something new in the first four minutes. We've talked about that in the past and in negotiation too, dumb is smart. When you start off, I'm the best negotiator. I'm the smartest person that kind of puts up a lot of resistance. And so I'm not saying be a moron, but you don't have to put them down, back them into a corner, make them feel dumb. That could hurt the negotiation process. It gives you some things to follow. I would add, especially rapport and trust. Those are the big ones. In fact, let me add something to that. We've got the rapport. You're building relationships. You really want to crank up that trust. Make dependence a factor. Show them how both sides rely on each other. We have to get this done. We have a win-win. There's mutual gains. We're going to reciprocate. We're going to get this done. We're going to cooperate. We're going to share valuable information with each other. That is the key. You've identified what's in it for them, what's in it for you. They're okay what's in it for you. You're okay what's in it for them. It's a win-win situation. You're dependent on each other. You've got to get this done. Assuming you've developed that relationship, you have that rapport, this is going to really crank up the trust. That is another key factor in getting the negotiation done doesn't matter what you're negotiating. If they don't like and trust you, there's going to be resistance. So during the negotiation process, your job is to find those solutions that give value to both parties. And you find that out in the listening phase. Your ability to handle objections is another one we can add here. And you got to love objections. Treat objections as opportunities. The worst thing is they don't have any questions or objections or thoughts. No, this is good. This dictates where you're going to go in the negotiation. Now, you got to realize this is a knee-jerk objection. They're thrown out there. They don't really mean it. But through questions and through empathy and listening, you can find out, all right, this is a true objection. And address it calmly. Address it together. The challenge is a lot of people come across as they've been offended. How dare they ask that? Handling objections is key. And if you're stuck on an objection, how would you solve that? What is your opinion? What's your thoughts? What's your advice? How would you do that? You'll be amazed how they open up when you ask their opinions or advice, their thoughts, what they would do. Just by asking that keeps the door of negotiation open. Even with kids, teenagers, you know the answer's no, and it would save you probably five, ten minutes to just say no. But if you can hear their point of view, get their thoughts, their opinions, advice, even if you do say no, they're more likely to accept that than if you didn't listen to those thoughts, opinions, and advice. It takes you a little longer. But remember, slow is fast, especially with persuasion and negotiation. So there you have it. That's the lens. Gives you better outcomes for you and your clients. You have a structure you follow. Of course, again, you need to add the rapport and the trust and handling objections, a few other things in there. But it's a good, sturdy formula to follow to just kind of think through the negotiation process while you're doing it and even before you do it. And it'll build better relationships, you'll get the negotiation done faster, and it'll help you in those high-pressure situations, especially when you're not sure what to do next. Keeps you from making the big major mistake or blunder with negotiation is just showing up. Studies show the lack of preparation is the biggest blunder in a negotiation. And so now you have a structure to follow and prepare before you even get there. So take something you learned today. You're going to work on your listening, your empathy, your EQ your negotiation, rapport, and trust skills, or just coming to an agreement. So this week's special, we're going to continue with your perfect persuasive presentation. Take your presentation IQ and go to presentationiq.com or go to maximizeyourinfluence.com. Click on Podcast 520. All the links for this podcast are there. And the link to take your presentation IQ. It's free. 10 questions. It's not going to take you a lot of time. Helps with my research. Helps identify what we can work on. If we're doing that, you get the free training webinar on how to create and deliver a perfect persuasive presentation and you can convince with charisma. All the PDFs, everything you need is going to be available to you. It will change the game for you. 
because anybody can present, but are you persuasive? And let me offer a freebie that we talked about before. I do executive speech coaching, adding a little charisma, a little riz, a little persuasiveness, help you with the structure and the outline. Hey, first one's for free. Let me prove my worth and take your presentation, your charisma skills to the next level. Send me an email at Kurt at MaximizeYourInfluence.com with the coaching request or anything else you want to hear on the podcast. Remember, we use your question on the podcast. You get the free gold version of InfluenceUniversity.com. There you have it. Massive skills become a better negotiator, better influencer, better person, make more money, be more successful, and go out and persuade with power.